Good morning and welcome to the CLT webinar series. I'm Barbara Lohman, the Coastside Land Trust Board President, welcoming you today. Um, I also want to remind you that our other webinars are on the Coastside Land Trust website so that you can watch them at any time. Today, I'm excited to introduce Kimberly Young, who is going to speak about the one of the most charismatic arthropods, the monarch butterfly. Kim is a Xerxes Education and Conservation Specialist Ambassador. She is a UC Master Gardener with the California Native Plant Society. She also designs gardens to provide habitat and forage for pollinators and particularly with large landowners that want to be stewards of monarch butterflies. Today, she's going to talk about Western monarch conservation and stewardship. And I'm really excited to hear about the, the conditions today and what we're hoping for in the future of the monarch butterfly. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning and thank you for joining us. I'm so honored that you chose your time to be with us and your interest in Western monarchs. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Western monarch conservation and about our Western population, the status of, and the burgeoning interest in planting for Western monarchs and how the public can help this iconic butterfly. My goal, is to support your endeavors, your desires, and that to let you know you do not have to be an environmental scientist, a biologist, or a botanist to make a huge difference, especially in the pollinator world. Monarch butterflies are in two groups, the Eastern and the Western. Both are in severe decline, but the Western population has far lower numbers. I'd like to first tell you about our group. Our group uh, is the Xerxes Society. And I wanted to tell you a quick story. Uh, quite a long time ago, quite a few years ago, I went to a Xerxes workshop in the Sacramento area. And it was given by three women who worked for Xerxes. It was an almost all day workshop and I had to travel far to go to it. And it changed my life. I was um, so inspired by these three women. They were so kind, knowledgeable. We were in the field looking at insects. They were teaching us about insects. And I left changed and inspired and went on to create a half acre pollinator garden after. And um, the, these, this Circe's workshop from these kind Circe's women just impacted my life. Um, first, I wanted to also tell you about the work that Circe's is doing to help invertebrates and what our group uh, is and does. Circe's was formed when it was shown how much much needed pollinators were struggling and Xerxes was founded in 1971 by Robert Pyle and is named after the Xerxes blue butterfly which is in the right um, the inspiration for the name off in the right corner. The Xerxes blue was numerous on the San Francisco Peninsula which what which is now extinct. Robert Pyle the founder um, had such significance in this butterfly and the name that his quote, I turned over in my mind the for a movement. It occurred to me that we in America had already lost such a butterfly, the Xerxes blue on the San Francisco Peninsula in the early forties. The X of Xerxes I imagine would make a perfect symbol for extinction and could be brought into a butterfly shape. 
We are international with headquarters in Portland, Oregon, and we have a huge presence in California, which I really appreciate, which since I am a California person and my work is done here. And there's tremendous work being done by Xerces in California. Um, one of the really important things that we really need to talk about is this iconic butterfly that has a migration that is imperiled in the uh, insect world. As you know, the coastal California regarding Western monarchs is a critically important place. What are they looking for? Monarchs are looking for what is called a Goldilocks microclimate. They really need to have um, enough, um, uh, enough of humidity, temperature, and they also need to have a lot of wind protection. So when we're talking about this butterfly that needs to survive in order to continue on the next generation, that microclimate is really important to them. So the westerns winter on the California coast and get that not usually much uh, uh, temperate climates in order to survive. The other thing they're looking for is high quality nectar. On this uh, slide, it shows that five mile radius that we're going to be talking about, if you can remember this um, map, we're gonna be mentioning that a lot since we are talking uh, about Half Moon Bay area, San Mateo County, and a lot of things that can help you be successful. What they're not looking for along the coast is milkweed, and we'll be talking at length about that. This is the, um, both, both the Eastern and the Western, they are separated by the Rockies, they are um, having a migration that begins when the temperatures warm up, the Easterns go winter in Mexico and the Westerns uh, along the coast of California. And this graph shows the dates, data that was collected and their migratory path. The life cycle of the monarchs is when the weather warms up and we have a, um, meet, then the monarchs go out of um, reproductive diapause. Basically diapause is that, that generation that goes to the overwintering site. They are going to um, be carrying on the next generation and the monarch life cycle um, is really dependent on all those microclimates that we talked about. The monarchs are native to North and South America as they are a migrating butterfly. It takes three to four generations to return back to the overwintering sites along the California coast and they need that habitat to survive the winter and especially the winter storms. The generation that arrives to the overwintering site lives the longest to carry the other um, generations forward and they should go into reproductive diapause, which is suspended maturity to carry on the next generation. When the temperatures rise and they uh, begin to breed and then begin their migratory behavior and begin that migration that is unparalleled in the insect world. They, they leave um, after they breed and then they go um, in search of milkweed. Um, the females are going to um, need abundant milkweed 
uh, they can often lay um, a few hundred eggs. Uh, and when the eggs are laid, the larva goes through instar stages, which are shown off to the left. They go through um, five instar stages to maturity before pupating. And then the meta, the meta, really the metamorphosis of an insect, uh, a caterpillar is amazing. But in the monarch world, we have one of the most beautiful chrysalis that is very iconic with the gold dots that many of you are probably aware of. And even the caterpillars are gorgeous. Also, um, I, can, I would be amiss if I do not um, bring up in these stages, a lot of us um, have grown up thinking that because of milkweed, eating milkweed, which makes them toxic to a lot of birds especially, but there are two species of birds that will eat, eat monarchs. Monarchs are very, um, they have a lot of predators, uh, wasps, ants, spiders, and even uh, ladybugs will eat um, a monarch egg. Xerxes does a Thanksgiving count um, and now uh, a New Year's count and it is um, funded and but we have a lot of volunteers that work the count and this year with COVID we thought um, there might be a drop in sites monitored but in fact it was the opposite. We had even three more sites monitored than last year. Uh, a wonderful person, Mia Monroe, co-founded this, has done an immense amount of time and these volunteers and uh, people that count give um, countless dedication and hours to the Thanksgiving and New Year's count and I, they, uh, they touch me always. The um, overwintering site management and protection. Um, I really wanted to let you know this is part of our website also. Xerxes has a very developed website that I really want to talk about with the valuable amount of resources that are in this website that will help you be successful in any endeavor that you choose to do, whether it is advocating, uh, planting um, on a patio, all the way to a large habitat planting. And the overwintering site management is a huge priority with the decline. Now, unfortunately, we can't talk about Westerns without talking about what is going on out there. Unfortunately, it's a, a bit of devastating news. We have a immense amount of decline that is a mark. This blue line is a the 30, under 30,000, the Western, um, are from going from millions in the 80s to a decline that our scientists, our monarch scientists have said that if we get under the 30,000, that what can they recover? And unfortunately, we have gone under that amount. The latest Thanksgiving count that was done and announced recently. We have only 1,914 Western monarchs counted with 246 counts, 246 sites that were counted. Um, on the slide to the right is the graft. And I wanted to show it larger so that the um, 
green bar, it's now in 2020 barely visible. And to understand the amounts that that we had and off to even as you can see in 1997, the amounts we had um, even then. Uh, what is the reason why are we having this crisis? Um, the loss of degradation of overwintering habitat is a huge part of it. The degradation of our overwintering sites in California. The loss of degradation of breeding and migrating habitat, which means anything from when they leave the overwintering site and they are now out trying to find um, milkweed and nectar. Also, pesticides are a huge factor. Uh, they are, um, they respond very much to pesticides and we have um, a huge amount um, being distributed in California um, with ag, and um, we have a we have it is something that plays a part in the decline. Also, climate change is making a um, huge impact on them. It, it is disrupting their migratory patterns, their behaviors, and their breeding patterns. Um, we are having warmer winters where now some are uh, breeding in January. I had somebody send me a photo from Soquel, um, January 10th, a breeding, a breeding pair in Soquel. Climate change is um, affecting and without reproductive diapause, they do need to um, have a rest period to survive that long amount of time that they will be overwintering. And in some places that isn't happening and we're having um, reproductive behavior changes and migratory behavior changes. Uh, disease and parasites, um, they are prone to a lot of different um, diseases and, and parasites that can um, be imposed on them that especially if um, they are under a heavy stress load and the amount of um, nectar sources and aren't available. So they really need to um, be able to re get restored to survive that, that winter too. And of course, we can't talk about the decline of Western monarchs in California without mentioning our immense change in the increase of wildfires in California and the West. Um, the Western monarchs, as, you, as that one graph shows them that they do go Arizona, Nevada, Utah, all of, all of the West is being affected by wildfires, which is also creating a loss of habitat, nectar, native plants, um, all the valuable resources that they need to survive. And this uh, map is also, this. it's an integrative map that is on Xerxes website that you can go into the Half Moon Bay area and all along the California coast and get more information. Um, like the Ventana wilderness was very effective by um, uh, the wildfires, as you can see down here in the southern part and um, immense amount of loss in the Santa Cruz area. So we, we can't talk about the decline without mentioning with climate change how how much habitat loss is being created. So what can called action and this is a big part 
of what um, a lot of us in the monarch world, we advocate for protecting and managing California overwintering sites and to support towns and cities um, and help to provide funding. Many of the sites are on um, public land, which is towns, golf courses, um, but a lot of it is on private land. Wherever a monarch decides to overwinter, they're not uh, caring whether it is public or private land, they are looking for the microclimate they need to survive. Um, number two, that restore breeding and migratory habitat in California is a huge one. That one will be crucial to their survival. And that is where many of us can help. And um, it is thought and um, one of the, the concerns and that many monarch scientists are talking about is, are we losing them in the first generation? That when they leave the overwintering sites, um, that is happening earlier and earlier sometimes um, before they would start to leave in March. Now some are leaving in February. That has erupted that early. Milkweed dies to the ground or native milkweeds die to the ground as, as they should. And so we need more of those early emerging milkweed species um, planted more. We used to have an abundance of them. Our development sites um, are, are, um, have wiped out a lot of those early emerging milkweeds. Um, and uh, one of the early emerging ones that I will be talking about later, Californica, that likes the foothills and does not like the valley. And a lot of that has been lost to development. And so there is a real push by Xerxes to have uh, growers be able to um, get more of these highly needed native milkweeds growing and distributing. And I will talk more about uh, our planting kits. And what we really need is spring and fall blooming nectars. Um, that is another thing I'll be talking uh, more about and touch on because when the monarchs come to the overwintering sites, they really need to build their supplies on nectar to be able to survive the winter. And also in the spring when they are coming out of diapause to have nectar for them that is much needed for now as they begin that amazing migratory journey. So in the plant guides that I'll be showing, and I'll be pointing out the bloom times of the plants and why those are something that needs attention of when we choose to plant these plants that they need so much to pay attention to their, the bloom times so that they're there when they come through your area that those plants are there. With Half Moon Bay, um, we will be talking about the coastal uh, plants mostly for this webinar and their bloom times. Uh, number three, protect monarchs and their habitat from pesticides. This I'll be talking about um, again more because they we cannot have a species that is migratory being exposed to so much pesticides and survive. What there is um, a documentation of a mosquito spraying done at the wrong time and it, um, it killed a lot of monarchs. Number four, protect, manage and restore summer breeding and fall migration habitat outside of California. As uh, we talked about, monarchs do, Western monarchs do have a wide range of migration and we have um, 
people from all over in Arizona. We had a lot in Utah of sightings and they are um, high, highly dedicated individuals all over the West in all of everyone trying to protect and manage and restore the summer breeding um, of Western monarchs in those states. Also answer key research, research questions about how to best aid Western monarch recovery. That will be um, getting to, and at the end, we will be answering questions. So Half Moon Bay area, as you can see, you are in priority area number one. Circes has um, recently developed the priority action zones in California for recovering Western monarchs. That area, the green is um, that five mile ra radius that you see on the map, but that light blue priority one is crucial to the survival of this iconic butterfly. Um, number one in the monarch's first stopover zone, which will be the first generation leaving the overwintering sites to protect and plant early season native milkweeds and nectar plants, as, as we spoke about before. Also, the green in the coastal areas where monarchs overwinter to plant native nectar plants. Um, Pismo Beach has worked really hard to restore their area, but in um, there was a glitch where the city did um, approved some cutting of trees at Pismo Beach has always been our number one overwintering site. And this last um, year, these trees were cut and uh, that shouldn't have been that, um, that protection and habitat was taken down. And Pismo had a very significant drop in overwintering monarchs. So that um, coastal areas where monarchs overwinter protect and restore that is a priority number one. Number two area of that part of California is protect and plant native milkweed and nectar plants. And of course, five miles from the coast, um, we, we need a lot of milkweed planted. But what is also in um, a huge need is plant native nectar plants, high quality nectar. So, that part is crucial out of um, the five mile radius of, of a native milkweed and also nectar plants of, can be planted on the coast. So if you want to plant milkweed, but you're in that five mile radius in Half Moon Bay area, as you could see here, we we need, they need nectar plants as much as they need milkweed. We can't help in the conservation of monarchs without all of us collectively working. Um, the work that is being done is immense um, from many groups. Circe's partners with a lot of groups. Um, with the conservation. And as you can see here, um, about, there's many. I can't list them all, but um, Monarch Joint Venture, we have another great website with a lot of great resources and um, information. And also the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, one on the left. So I encourage you to um, please also check out their websites that uh, we have listed here. Also, I, I need to talk about the conservation work of many. Um, there are so many um, citizen scientists out there 
that are observing, collecting data. And this work of conservation is, um, and is incredible. I'm always touched when I go to um, uh, Xerxes um, field work in the past or a website, there are many people out there and it's gonna take a lot to conserve a um, migratory insect. I love this photo by Brian there. Okay, now we have to talk about um, the declining insect diversity and abundance. And I also need to touch on insects just don't get the love that they deserve. There's a well-known um, Whole Foods photo that you might have seen where it's side by side, where they, they take out pollinators from a grocery produce section of Whole Foods uh, where it's regularly stocked and then what it would be like without pollinators and it's only 20% left in the produce section. Um, we have had um, some devastating news from the state of California that insects are not, I'm, I wanna read this so that I, um, I don't get them um, misquoted. Um, when, when Xerxes and they partnered with other for protection from California, that we could protect insects. Um, and we just, they, they ruled that, um, and of course there were some, a few um, ag groups, and a judge ruled that insects do not meet the criteria of being protected in California. So um, when we're trying to get protection for the monarch, that recent news is first our California news, but then Xerxes partnered and, and we uh, had in, on December 15th, a long awaited um, ruling from the United States Fish and Wild, Wildlife Agency that um, monarchs cannot um, get the protection that we need. Basically, um, this is the statement. We conducted an intensive and thorough review using a rigorous, transparent science-based science process and found that the monarch meets listing criteria under the Endangered Species Act, which the petition um, was applied for, um, said in a statement, however, we propose, before we can propose listing, we must focus resources on our high, higher priority listing actions, which unfortunately means there's so many that need to be on the Endangered Species Act uh, for the, that it's basically the monarchs need to wait in line. They warranted that, um, let me back up, um, what, what that 2014 uh, petition was, the monarch has declined so much in North America that in 2014, the Xerxes Society and our conservation partners, including Center for Biological Diversity, Center for Food Safety, and the, link, the late Dr. Lincoln Bauer, submitted a petition proposing listing the species under the Endangered Species Act. Six years later, on December 15, 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that listing the monarch butterfly under the Endangered Species Act was warranted but precluded, precluded I'm sorry, by higher priority actions. In making this decision, the U.S. FWS agrees that monarchs are threatened with extinction, especially the Western population, 
which is in critical condition. But unfortunately, they did not provide the protection that they so desperately need to recover. What the Endangered Species Act would have provided the protection and the funding for uh, monarchs. Now, um, another bit of news I want to talk about is that our founder one time had said that uh, conserving invertebrates will be one of the most important and difficult things to do because insects often just don't get the love. We have a um, immense need for our insect diversity uh, and abundance in our, um, our need for the biodiversity that one, let's just go to the wildlife of a bird, a bird from a hatch, an egg from hatching to fledging, that will take the parents 1,400 insects to get that bird to maturity. Our whole biodiversity in our, which is incredibly important, uh, depends so highly on insect diversity. Um, what can all of us do to help be part of the solution? I like this photo because in my eye, I look at it and it kind of shows basically kind of what not to plant. What happened after I had that Xerces workshop with those three kind Xerces women that, that changed me forever is I came home and I just said, I'm going to do conscious planting. So a conscious gardening mindset of how I approach what I'm gonna plant. Am I going to plant an ornamental that might have low nectar and, um, and pollen source? Or could I plant something that benefits wildlife biodiversity and also that offers high quality nectar? So in our choices of planting, we can make huge difference in a small area. And as you see in this yard, it's loaded, but there are choices here that are ornamental and beautiful. And I'm not saying we can't do both, but that we dedicate areas that we, um, that we can feed our valuable insect population. This is also um, important to know that a little bit of space can make a huge difference and this could support hundreds of insects. I also love this Xerxes photo because it's very reflective of how much um, a area can make a difference. So for, for me, I would never have lawn. This whole thing would be socked in. First of all, lawns are very, um, they need a lot of water and um, nitrogen to keep them green and a lot of runoff into our um, water systems, which this little yard shows that. And then also into our growing areas and to support our farms and communities that are really doing a great job. We have a lot of farms that are very conscious of not using insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, uh, uh, the, um, the organic and non-treated um, uh, movement is growing all the time and getting more and more supported. We're all having the awareness of how a little decision about the grocery store of supporting our organically grown food choices make a difference. And then right across the street, this could be a just a little patch of the hillside not planted and somebody can put in uh, nectar and milkweed and feed in abundance. And then also the sunflowers over here, we'll talk more about that. 
and also um, windbreak, you know, that. So this one photo, I've always, um, this little piece of art, I've always loved. It is very representative of um, being conscious of what, what can be done. What do butterflies need? Now we're going to talk about plants and um, how much we can do. And as I spoke about, in a little bit of space. Uh, we're going to talk about, does everything need to be native? There's so much nectar sources needed. Um, Xerxes does not, um, we don't poo-poo the whole non-native. Um, there are high nectar sources in non-natives, and we don't want um, you to think that you have to stick there, but I want to let you know that there are some better choices in, in what in that in those families of how you could choose. And of course, there'll be a lot on our website about that. Okay, but it's not just about milkweed. For a long time, it was plant milkweed, plant milkweed, plant milkweed, and milkweed alone isn't going to save them, especially at this point. And I wanted to point out um, these two well-known photos. Um, Stephanie um, of Xerxes has shown how a field of this high nectar source is great, but on the right side, that looks like some speciosa milkweed, but that is actually uh, a whole milkweed patch that was affected by a, um, a drift of um, a chemical drift that came over to that milkweed and contaminated the whole field and that um, the large leaf showed, but all of those, um, that was a, a chemical drift. Uh, native plants. The first plants we reach for are, and when we talked about uh, biodiversity, why native plants are uh, such a great choice is because the, these are the plants that um, they have evolved with and their gut flora, all the, the things that uh, native plants are usually resistant to pest and diseases far more than our hybrids and our um, insects are usually having a higher quality um, of nectar. And they also are adapted to our soils. Um, California natives have a huge range um, that we're going to be talking about. Of, and they're usually drought tolerant, but the range can be from shade to sun. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. And I encourage you also on our website to, because that is something that could be a whole separate talk, but I want to touch enough about it of how to make it successful on your choices. So why we search for native plants, um, they're adapted to the soil, uh, low water use, usage, and they're also have evolved to our soil. And they're also, their survival is um, DNA to evolve with the climate. The relationships between native plants and native wildlife is immense. Um, that biodiversity has kept many, many species thriving. The timing match uh, that we talked about earlier that we touched on of flowers when its pollinators are active. So if you're in an area in California and in the migratory pattern, say Half Moon Bay, they're not really there in the summer. So along the coast, so one wouldn't really want to concentrate on summer blooming um, and push out the, the, the bloom pushing out in the summer. You really want to focus on your fall and spring. So here's the, the seasons of some native plants and to show that 
there's many natives that have a high um, high season rate from spring, summer, fall, and winter, of course, in in this um, along the along the coast. And there's great talks. There's a, a great talk I listened to from a botanist on um, native plants in the Half Moon Bay area that is fantastic that Coastside Land Trust recently gave that I encourage you to watch on their website. Here's the uh, plant resource from Xerxes website. We have regional um, planting um, brochures that are very um, detailed. And here is the bloom that I was talking about earlier, uh, the bloom from spring to summer, spring to fall, summer, summer to fall, winter to spring. And the, um, the key here on the um, attractive to monarchs. So we have a lot of planting guides on our website. And the plants are numerous. Here is also Calscape. I really wanted to point out Calscape, why it's such a great site. Um, this is the California Native Plant Society. That a lot of work has also been put into this website, but I wanted to point out right here, the butterflies uh, are, that tab is so useful and also nurseries, um, more planting guides, but also that you could put in your address and it will show um, what is native to your area. And when you go to the butterfly key up here, it will show the butterfly that it supports. Um, often with plant, uh, native plants, my number one question I get is, I can't find the plants. California Native Plant Society has um, such immense knowledge, but they also have great plant sales. And during COVID, many um, have had virtual plant sales and also the UC Master Gardeners has had plant sales. And a lot of UC Master Gardeners focus on those high nectar, high quality nectar plants and Calif California natives. So please know that this website is so useful and you can um, put in your specific address even, and it will bring up valuable information for you and a nursery guide of where to find them. Um, now, if we could talk a little bit about the plants, what do I plant to help support monarch butterflies and pollinators? I'm focusing on monarchs, and but th this would the great thing about plant, having a, a native establishing a planting is that you won't just be supporting monarchs and their high need for high quality nectar, but all pollinators and and supporting invertebrates. Um, monarchs are looking for often a disc shaped plant, kind of like uh, the daisy and some sunflower world. Buckwheats are a great choice. They have um, high quality nectar. They are bloom area. Um, some of the buckwheat that are really great for the coast are California buckwheat, coast buckwheat, and native buckwheats. There are many buckwheat choices, so I really encourage um, you to search them out. Another, the, this is the late blooming, the Pacific aster and the golden rods, that it will be the late fall when they're really needing those um, high quality nectar to really bulk up for the winter. Those are late in the season, the fall. 
And of course, we can't talk about the Half Moon Bay area without talking about the need for native plants that um, can grow in sand, the coastal sand verbenas. We have quite uh, the Pacific strawberry, the coast angelica. There are a lot of the coast strawberry grows in sand also and can also um, help support a sand bank. So there are many um, native plants that monarchs love that grow in very sandy soils. Another is that daisy family. Um, this is a California native um, that's sometimes called seaside fleabane right here that is the seaside daisy. They like those, um, those that have a lot of abundance in one area. A lot of these plants, their growth habitat is a lot in one plant and that this nectar source is really high quality. So the seaside daisy, it again loves the coast and they, they don't like clay soil, but they like fast draining soils. This is the woolly sunflower. These are all California natives, a native yarrow. Uh, sorry about that, very high close up of a ceanothus. There are a lot of native ceanothus for the coast and a lot of, um, that is a close up of a coyote um, a mint. And um, this makes me also want to make sure that there are some native um, megaria and thistles too. So these are all of high quality nectar. Uh, can, these are, easily found um, and often uh, extremely long-lived with little care. I have a Julia Phelps Ceanothus and uh, Concha and um, Black Sage. And they say, if you plant Black Sage, quail will come. Well, sure enough, those three plants, I planted Black Sage, it's probably 15 foot across and my Julia Phelps Ceanothus that they developed their home with and coffee berry and just those four plants alone when I planted as babies, the wildlife they've supported. So that part in starting a pollinator garden is you're gonna have a garden that you are really gonna enjoy seeing a lot of wildlife in. And now we're talking about a little bit of non-natives, um, but there are choices. Just this is uh, California aster, echinaceas. Um, there are um, plants you can choose that will still feed monarchs and pollinators. Uh, Chithionia, a lot of the sunflower family, um, their butterflies are very attracted to, especially Tithonia. I don't have a photo here, but it's an orange bright flower that is beautiful. Um, they really favor Tithonia. I should have put a photo, apologize for that. Now I have to talk about pesticides. Um, one of the things, uh, there's a Xerces talk that was recently done that I really love. Um, by Jessa and 98% uh, of in, in the insect world have cr created, of all the insects, have created problems. Um, so I need to give you a quick story of before I started to get information. I was growing a vegetable garden and I saw the, these bugs and they were so alarming, ugly, and they were coated all over a kale. And I, but I went and I looked it up and it was ladybug larva. And of course I didn't go spray something, but I want, I just want to encourage that before any insecticide is brought out, 
what can be done that will you could that can do you can do without using an insecticide another thing that happened i had harlequin beetles that um was on um some sunflowers that i grew and i just did early monitoring and hand removal was able to keep them under control um i am able to grow a lot and never use a pesticide. And I have thriving abundance of vegetables and flowers. Um, and I, we have a lot of acres and I, I don't use a pesticide, but I'm able to be able to still have abundance in my crops. Another um, thing on these chemicals, when you're doing pesticides, they have been tested not for native bees, butterflies, and all of that. They've really been tested for a caution, the different caution, even which is the lowest rating. But those have been done on lab rats and all the, when the EPA rates these. So I want to encourage you before you bring out any insecticide, you know, how is it infecting other um, insects? And is it also something I could do manually? Um, you can go to the IPM on UC, the IPM, um, that will be in a follow up email. And it integrated pest management is what can I do of the least um, invasive way to be able to achieve my control of this. Uh, so please minimize use, read the label, read the guidance carefully. Um, remember that some things are just a spot, like when you grow milkweed, basically what's going to happen is you're going to have oleander aphids. Well, if you're early monitoring, which is always key is the early monitoring to control. And that is sometimes taking daily of whatever you're growing, that early monitoring. So like milk, we just snip off the aphids, the oleander aphids, they'll be bright orange and um, dispose of that. And it helps the milkweed to branch out. Um, there, there's just a lot of other methods that can be done before one brings out a pesticide. So please reach out to the integrated pest management um, and also other sources are there to know what else that you could use. Um, source carefully. Unfortunately, our nursery plants, um, especially in box stores, are often treated with insecticides um, and sometimes in prevention, not even that they've been evidence to be there um, to control um, a problem such as white flies or whatever it might be. And sometimes neonicotinoids are used to um, control um, a pest. And they, they are um, long lasting in the plant tissue. Neono to get neonic free is important, especially when you're establishing a pollinator garden. And again, those California native plant cells and all the others are really important. There is a study and you can find that on our website also of several milkweeds were tested and, and there was not one not pesticide free. And there was also another study done of um, milkweeds in gardens and the, they uptake the, um, out of the soil, the neonics. So, and one, milkweed had 16 residues of pesticides in it. So what we don't see with our eye 
is of course, as all of us know, is affecting our insect population. The San Mateo um, area, I have on the key here, of on our website, we have Monarch Milkweed Mapper and also Cal Flora and Journey North and iNaturalist have mappers that is really needed to be used. iNaturalist website, put it on your phone. And basically, if you see a sighting of milkweed, monarch of any stage from age all the way up to adult. And when you go on the website of monarch milkweed mapper, it will show. And then if you see a breeding pair, like the person who sent me a photo of Soquel on January 10th of the breeding pair, um, he went and entered it in a milkweed mapper. And this will show um, and give valuable data and will show any sight, any sightings that, and we really need this information and we need the data entered in. And this, I did a little screenshot of Half Moon Bay area of monarchs and this last year for 2020. Sadly, it wasn't um, very many, but hopefully, and this, this one does not include the data from Journey North or iNaturalist, et cetera, just um, Circe. So I encourage you to, you, uh, to use this and it's very user friendly. The photo on the right, I took up a mating pair on um, at our place. And um, that was five years ago. And unfortunately we haven't um had that happen we have a lot of milkweed and nectar and hope to see this again now i have to talk about tropical um it has become very problematic because it is disrupting sometimes the migratory um problem, but it doesn't, it's not a native milkweed and it sold a lot in box stores and it got very OE problems and there's a lot to be said about that, but just wanted to encourage to please plant natives instead that this one is becoming problematic. And here is planting natives in um, uh, the area of Half Moon Bay and where um, native milkweeds historically grow. There, I also want to talk about that Xerces has monarch and pollinator habitat kits. Uh, San Mateo County didn't um, plant any, but there are a lot of planting restorations, parks in different areas that we have this available. And in um, April, the application opens up for that, and I encourage you to check that out and consider an area with your group that perhaps you might want to take that on. And we offer a lot of support in, in your endeavors there. Again, Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper um, that I talked about before, and this is a little bit of explaining um, what happens on this website and also off to the right are many partners. This is a photo of the early emerging milkweeds that we need. Um, they're both gorgeous. The one on the left is Californica and the other one Cordifolia. Co Cordifolia is um, sometimes called heartleaf. They're both, um, we need more of these out in that radius when they leave the overwintering site, they are, are early emerging. I took this photo because you can protect your milkweed seed, especially if you want it to, um, you want to harvest your seed. Also, when you grow milkweed, you might have milkweed bugs that love to eat the seed. I do have them occasionally. So you can cover it with a blossom bag, a, a favor bag, a little gossamer string, string bag and save your seeds too for 
planting more milkweed or sharing it. I would be amiss if I don't talk about Jane Kim. Um, her studio is in Half Moon Bay. Um, monarch art um, artists are trying to bring awareness, especially Jane. She has um, across the West been commissioned to do some art. This one to the bottom right is in the Tenderloin in San Francisco this last year that they did. And I watched through the Instagram stories of her and her team on scaffolding doing this tremendous, gorgeous art of uh, bringing awareness. And you're really lucky to have Jane Kim um, in the Half Moon Bay area. I love her. I have a good friend, Connie, who um, more monarch art and of course, monarch photography. This, this photo, when I saw it, it changed me. Um, it is so symbolic of me. Um, we have these wings to fly. We decide to take these journeys. We might get a little beaten up along the way, this tattered monarch. Um, this is on a Monterey Cypress and she took this photo. It's very iconic. Um, it means a lot to me. Uh, it represents so much that we have a lot going against us now to save them. But um, this photo represents to me how we have to keep going. And where do we go from here? Well, it makes my determination stronger. And um, they don't give up easily. And so I advocate for, for all I can do. And then here is um, some that we've mentioned that we have a lot on the website. Please check it out. Uh, and also, um, we have great publications. Here is the Gardening for Butterflies. Encourage you to check that out. Lots of great info on that. And we have um, immense amount of support. And also, thank you so much and all the people that made all of this information from this website possible. And I thank you for that time of listening and open for questions. Thank you so much, Kim. This was a wonderful presentation. And I, I know there's a number of people who've asked some really good questions that, and we're thankful that you're gonna take a little bit of time to answer some of these questions. Um, and I also know that you're, you will be attaching several um, links to our follow-up email. So all of you who are participating in this webinar, if you will be, uh, you will be receiving an email. Um, and there are a number of links that Kim wanted to attach to that. So if not, if your question is not answered um, today, it very well might be something that you can find an answer to in the links that we'll be providing for you. Um, so Kim, I thought I'd start with some of the questions that are a little bit the bigger, uh, sort of larger reaching, and then we could sort of zoom in on some of the more specific questions for planting. Um, and one of the sure. one of the starting uh, one of the you first do ones. Do the best you can. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, Jane um, was asking. Yes. She was saying that the eucalyptus groves are non-native. So where did butterflies overwinter before eucalyptus were imported to California? Um, they loved the native trees, Monterey cypress, Monterey pine. Um, and there are so um, many that are prioritizing as you look on our website, the Pismo Beach Restoration Plan, which is amazing work. And they are doing a lot of planting of the native trees. Of course, um, one has to be patient. And of course, they need them now. But there were a lot of Monterey Cypress, Monterey Pines in the, the California native trees that they roosted in. Um, another question is, is there any particular effort underway that you want to talk about, about the approach to um, how they're supporting monarch migration needs in uh, and revegetation of vast acres of the wildlands that were affected by the fires? 
and what's, what's Xerxes' role with that? You know, there are. Um, in that I touched on the talk, yeah, there's an amazing amount of people, um, as you can tell, this butterfly strikes a lot of hearts and amazing amount of work, time, countless volunteer uh, hours to do restorative plantings. And um, Xerxes is really trying to make as many uh, plantings available with the funding, um, limited funding, you know, but that they can. So um, they can't always provide all the planting kits that they'd like, uh, but that is another way to, to support and advocating is that a lot of these groups might even have the planting groups, but they, they need the, the resources and the funding. So, but yes, there are a lot of restorative plantings happening. Um, another question was about the East Coast monarch population, how that compares to the Western um, monarch population at this point. Yes, uh, they are in severe decline either. Nothing like the Westerns. Um, there is a big move to support the, um, uh, the forests in Mexico. They do have loggers that will come uh, and remove the trees. So there's a big push to remove their, to protect their overwintering sites also. There was a push to um, boycott Mexico avocados and not, and only um, purchase California avocados because allowed to grow avocados. It's a very um, desired crop and some trees were being removed. So there are a lot of people working very diligently to protect the Eastern population also, but they are um, very affected by climate change, the Eastern population with the monoculture crops of corn and soy, a lot of uh, pre-treated um, seed uh, that uh, was treated with a pesticide coated seed, the movement to try to end that practice of monoculture and the preceded trees. So a lot is being done to help protect the Easterns also. Um, and then just particular areas, uh, the best places to view these monarch, um, to, to, to view the monarch along the San Mateo coast. Unfortunately, um, and I, got the, um, the count from Mia right before the talk, but the sightings have been rare. Um, we used to have Sweetwater uh, campground area there, and sadly this year there weren't um, any. It was zero um, at that overwintering site, I'm sorry to say. But um, our site, that had the most monarchs, as I said before, was Pismo, but the closest where you could probably see them over wintering is um, in Santa Cruz in the Natural Bridges area. My childhood overwintering site, I was born and raised on the Monarch Peninsula and Pacific Grove is near and dear to my heart and we had zero this year. My friend Connie who Count said area, um, but she saw one in Pacific Grove after the count was over and just one. So it's getting harder to view them at overwintering sites before there would be clusters. You know, I remember when I was a child, there were clusters hanging from the PG overwintering site sanctuary and a, a branch broke and it was a chandelier those, those days are long gone. Um, we are um, having rare sightings, but um, we are not having sometimes um, viewing areas now. With the 
1,914, that was over 246 sites. So when you go to view, please remember to bring your binoculars also. And keep track of them on iNaturals, keep track of what, we, what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah, there's actually right. someone who just responded to what you said, and right. they said that they checked uh, Sweetwater last week, and it was sunny, and they didn't see any, and that said two years ago, around the same time, there were many in that location. Yes, um, even two years ago, very, very different. When this last two years, the decline, um, drastic. Um, Sweetwater... Uh, always historically was a very active site. Mm -hmm. And also, do remember that butterfly uh, monarchs, they don't fly. Um, it has to be over 55 degrees. So in the morning is the best time to see them in the trees. Over uh, 55, they start to flutter. And also, it's important to note that they don't always stay at one overwintering site. They can travel in the winter to different sites. They're always in search of that, that perfect Goldilocks microclimate. So we can say, oh, they're, they're here, but that doesn't mean they're staying there. And unfortunately, at our, our New Year's count um, that Xerxes does, we don't have the numbers yet. They'll be announced any day now, but, um, we typically lose 40% from Thanksgiving to the new, from Thanksgiving count to the New Year's count. Mm -hmm. um, a number of questions about just with the drought, drought tolerant plants about succulents. I know you mentioned the verbena, but um, folks that are wanting to, that have a number of succulents in their yard or are looking to plant those, are there any succulents that you can think of that offer anything for the monarch that you would recommend? You know, I grow a lot of succulents and I should be better about this one, but I've never really depended on them to feed much because the flowers are just such a short period of time. Um, but there are a lot of echeverias that offer a lot of bloom that lasts a long time. So I would, um, in succulents, I would go more to the Echeveria family. Thank you. Um, another question was how you recognize a breeding pair. I'll look that up and in the follow-up email, I'll try to expand that. Thank you. Pardon me? Um, recognizing a breeding pair. So I'm Sorry, Kate, what, what, could you repeat that question? Sure. How you recognize a breeding pair? Um, is it just... Well, um, often, and, you'll, and people who follow this online, um, often the breeding happens on the ground and the female, um, I mean, the male will take the female up into a shrub or, or tree. So um, after a while, it just becomes very recognized, um, like the person that sent me, um, the photo from Soquel that I should have included in this talk, it was on a pine tree. So you'll, you'll just see the, it's different looking than a, you know, single monarch. Mm -hmm. What about um, any effective or safe ways to sort of wash a plant of possible insecticides before you plant? Okay, and is this specifically on any type of like perennial type plant or a milkweed um, specific was, did they mention that they in the question? It was oh. just uh, a garden plant. Okay, um, it's because that's a kind of a depend question, depends on the plant. Most plants you could just spray with water, you know, put your fan spray on do it in the morning so the plant has time to dry out. Um, in my mention that I don't ever use insecticides and I do grow a lot of native plants, but I do have a few ornamentals. Um, I grow some David Austin roses. 
and I don't use any chemicals at all. I'll just spray them you know, in the early spring when the aphids are here, spray them in the morning I've controlled. So just spray them with water in the morning, um, depends on the plant, but most of them just a hard spray, but that key point of early monitoring. And remember aphids especially are usually the ones that I have, they are asexual, so you they're so prolific. Um, and it, from one day to the other, you could have a problem where it's really is, and of course, um, most of every plant that is um, a pest to that plant is going to the tender new leaf. So when you monitor, look at the tender growth and remember too that biological control will happen, that the beneficial insects will come and start to take care of that pest plant, a pest insect, depending on what it is and, and what, what plant. Um, a couple of people are, you gave us a great list of different things to plant, um, but a, a couple of these uh, questions are about if you have a really small patch in San Francisco, a really small garden, what you would say sort of the bang for your buck, best plants that they're the most helpful to the environment and, and to the monarch. Any specifics from your list? Okay, um, if I... Yes, I would really go for anything in that um, that disc family that has um, the high nectar quality that you're really going after high nectar, depending on their soil, you know, San Francisco is often good drainage. So you could choose that seaside daisy, even the um, um, the woolly sunflower. Um, if you're in a small area and you um, needed to go for, um, uh, there's that popsicle verbena, they of the non native, I have that also, and butterflies love that one. There's just a lot that is small and condensed such as the seaside daisy and the um i'm trying to recall that that one that was um really high nectar like golden rocks but it's in a, a condensed form and um uh, I'm going to have to, I'll get, I'll get that in a, a follow up, but I, I still, my number one favorite is the buckwheats. They're small. They give a lot of nectar for a small plant. Um, I would probably for me, my number one to go would be the buckwheats and the seaside daisy. Um, we have a, a couple of folks who are, have joined us from um, a, a high school-led environmental conservation program called Beyond Terra, and they have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is that they're planning to use seed balls to plant nectar and milkweed plants that are native to the Bay Area at scale. Um, which wind sheltering plants would be useful for monarchs in the coast? Okay, yeah, the, the seed bomb movement has um, become really popular. Um, it, they, it has been really effective. The windbreak area, um, I would probably, if they could, do coffee berry. Um, coffee berry would be a great windbreak. It supports a lot of wildlife and it can become very dense quickly to provide the habitat that they're trying to establish and that windbreak. Okay. And Ceanothus and Black Sage, they grow large. Some um, habitats establishments do 
grow um, coyote bush uh, that you need a lot of space for. Um, that plant has two sexes. The male has a lot of pollen. Native bees like the male, but if you're going to do coyote bush for windbreak, uh, to choose the female plant, which has more nectar than pollen like the male. Um, and you are there that any might be an option, but uh, it, okay, I think there's a little yeah, I'd have to see the setting, you know, but um, trying to imagine what their setting might look like, I would do the coffee berry probably first choice or ceanothus type of ceanothus, of course, but more the berry big shrubs. Um, from that same group, they're interested in organizations that provide funding. Did you have, have any more, um, have any thoughts on organizations that provide funding for the, these projects for smaller groups? There are, there's a lot out there. Um, it, of course, I would encourage them to look at the planting kit uh, part mm -hmm. that I mentioned on the talk of that, um, perhaps with their area. And as I said, the applications begin in April for a native planting kit that perhaps they might be interested in. But there are a lot of organizations. Um, I uh, Some of the partners that I mentioned in our talk, uh, Monarch Joint Venture, the US uh, Fish and Wildlife, they are also on their website listing. Um, some programs, um, more and more of those are happening. So I'll send those links in the follow-up email of, um, of organizations that are offering that. Great, thank you. And your, your um, reference to, and we'll add that, we'll make sure that we um, add a link to the CalScape, the California Native Plant Society, because that sounds like such a rich, I mean, it is such a rich resource for folks that are looking to for sort of the, the, the more specific questions about planting and where to get particular plants and things for their, yes. um, for their gardens. I cannot uh, tout CalScape enough of how valuable it is um, that it's just a plethora of information. Um, a couple of folks are talking about living in the Redwoods, just just east of the coast or in La Honda. Um, have monarchs been known to pass mm -hmm. through those areas as well? It, historically, in years yeah. past, um, the net last two years, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Answered a lot of these. This is great. Um, you know, if there are another question is about birds that are predators. Do you know anything about which birds are predators of the monarch? There are a couple of Orioles, um, an Eastern Oriole. Um, there's they're really not a problem for us in Westerns. Um, the friend that I mentioned, Connie, she has another iconic photo of a branch that has been cut down, sadly, that is not there, but of squirrel on a branch eating a adult monarch butterfly. And the squirrels would, a squirrel would be probably more of a predator than those two species of birds. Most birds absolutely leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we have a few folks that actually threw theirs in the chat. Let's see if we have any in here. We have any covered. Um, yeah, I think you've really covered the questions that we that have been asked. So thank you, Kim, very, very much. Great, Kate. Time. Great. And thank you all for being here. My today. pleasure. And if you if you find that you still have a question that wasn't answered or a question that is is residual, if you want to send it, um, you can you can send it our way, and we'll pass it on to Kim, who's graciously um, accepted the challenge of answering questions that are coming 
coming through the organization. Um, and for those of you who had, uh, we, about a, a couple of days from now, we'll be sending out an email, uh, like we said. So there'll be an email coming to you with the recording of this if you want to share it or watch it again or look at something specifically. Um, and I know um, we will. There will be a number of links. I think someone asked here for a, a, a closer look at the zone map, and so we can definitely. I think Kim, can we get a, a picture of that, a zoomed-in picture of the? Uh, okay. Um, you had a great slide. That, um, they're just hoping to be able to zoom in a little bit and look more. Closely. The zone. Um, sure. Um, I did a couple of zone maps. Do you know which one specifically? Uh, I can send the, the link to both. Conservation zones. Okay. All right. I will send that. Thank you. All righty. And there's a number of um, Thank you. other links that will be attached to that. So um, be looking for that in your inbox in the next couple of days. Okay. Um, and also just a reminder that there are, okay. as uh, Barbara Lohman mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we have a number of great webinars that are on our website. You can view them through our... Oh, our sorry. Turn that down. <laughs> they, uh, through our past webinar Sorry about that. I thought I'd turn that down. Okay. Um, they're on our. Okay. Website. Could you repeat that, Kate? I'm sorry. Oh no, I, I'm just um just sharing that we have um people would be getting an email about all of the uh, all of the with the links, but also that if people are interested in looking at the past webinars, um, you can view those on our past webinars. So just check, hop onto our website, and you can look at the recordings of some of the webinars that we've done in the past. We have some great ones on native plants, especially for those of you who are really interested in the plant side of this, um, native plants and birds of the coast side and um, marine mammals and some other invertebrates. And um, we have some webinars coming up who are really looking forward to. We have um, just about a month, we have um, a, a virtual Anya Nuevo, a virtual elephant seal tour, which will be a really neat opportunity, especially because everything's closed down now. So. Um, it'll be a chance to view these elephant seal populations without the crowds. I think that'll be a pretty exciting one. Um, we also have one coming up in March, and these a couple of these are going to be popping up in the next couple of days on our website. But we have one coming in March about um, looking at different tracks and being able to identify the tracks and scat of our area here. Um, and then in April, we're going to be uh, Gary Griggs from the University of Santa Cruz. Um, he's going to be talking about the geology of the coast. So also really fascinating, great information. So please, if you're not on our mailing list, actually, you will become part of our mailing list for signing up <laughs> here for this uh, talk or if you've been a part of them. But it's a great, we really try hard not to oversend. So you won't be getting a lot of emails, but I'm um, just key keying you in on um, you know, the uh, webinars and also volunteer opportunities when those come back. Um, and we're able to be back in person. So thank you again. And if you haven't had a chance to donate or if you um, be, this is a wonderful opportunity to just um, hop into our donation page and, and make a donation to these programs, the webinar programs, the um, junior land stewards program, but also the preservation and conservation uh, and the stewardship of the land that we are uh, so many of us are appreciating right now more than ever. So thank you again to all of you who are here and have taken the time to be here today. And thank you to you, Kim Young, so much for this really, really wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, thanks again. Enjoy your weekend and the moisture. Thank you, Kate. All right. Thank you.